So I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Linda Olson, who is the most, talk about motivated and someone that's driven and has the attitude that if we can all grab a tiny bit of her attitude, it'll be amazing. She, as she's going to tell her own story, but basically she had an accident and ended up being a triple amputee back at when she was 29. Here she is 39 years later with a diagnosis of Parkinson's and here to talk to us. So with that, Dr. Olson. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you this morning or this afternoon now. My life as an amputee and our lives as Parkinson's patients have a lot of similar challenges. Challenges that we didn't ask for, that we didn't ask for our partners or our caregivers to put up with. Things like walking, trouble with our hands, sometimes looking funny. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> this morning, or this afternoon, I'd like to take you on my journey, a journey that for a few hours seemed like a disaster, but has turned out to be what many people consider to be an extraordinary life. Let me introduce myself. As I heard very often 39 years ago, Linda Olson is a 29-year-old third-year radiology resident who was involved in a train versus car accident in Berchtesgaden, Germany. This resulted in traumatic amputations of both legs above the knee, a high above right elbow amputation, and fractures of her spine. Three and a half weeks after the accident, the patient was medevaced back to the Naval Regional Medical Center in San Diego. Since I never lost consciousness, I could relive everything that happened that day. I could see a monstrously huge train coming toward us. I remember trying to get out of the van and I remember rolling out onto the track and then looking into my husband Dave's eyes as he grabbed me and for an instant held me in his arms. The braking train screeched toward us and just when it couldn't get any louder, there was an earth-shaking crash. It smashed into the van, toppling it over and pinning me underneath it as I lay on the track. Maybe I can stay alive if I hold my breath long enough. That's how I felt. If I let it out, I won't be able to breathe again. And then it stopped. I haven't any feeling. It's very still. I hear strange words. It doesn't matter what they say. If I can hear them, I must be alive. The train backs up and I hear shouts as people grunt and actually lifted the van off of me. I'm told later that I was pushed the distance of two football fields down the track before the crumpled mass of me and the van came to a halt. It was really less than 30 seconds from start to finish. I look up and I can see the sun. Strangers are looking down at me. They're easy to see because my glasses are still on, amazingly. I smile as they look at me and I try to talk to them, but something's not right. They're speaking gibberish. And then I remember, I'm in Germany and they must be speaking German and they have saved my life and pulled the van off of me. Waking up in the Salzburg Trauma Hospital, I know where I am. I know what happened, but what I don't know is how my husband Dave is doing. I haven't seen him since the accident, but I've been told that he broke his ankle and was knocked out. But will he be okay? Will he be okay having a severely disabled wife when he married a cute, slim doctor whom he hiked with and biked with and traveled with? What if I can't do those things anymore? Why would he want to stick around? The double doors swing open and I hold my breath as Dave hobbles in with crutches and his left leg in a walking cast. I need to be strong for him, so I smile as he reaches the side of my bed, all the while silently rehearsing the two sentences that I've memorized all night. I've been thinking about things. I'll understand if you don't want to stick around, and then I wait. He lets go of his crutches and tears run down his cheeks as he squeezes my hand. I didn't marry your arms and your legs. If you can do it, I can do it. <sighs> We'd been married for less than two years when the accident happened. I remember saying those old-fashioned vows to have and to hold. 
for better, for worse. We thought we knew what those words meant, but what if the minister had looked at us and looked into the future and said, do you promise to stay together if a train hits you and Linda loses her legs and an arm and breaks her back until death do you part 50 or 60 years later? It was really hard for me to understand why Dave would want to stay with me until he sat me down one day and said, Olsi, that's his nickname for me, put yourself in my place. What would you do if I'd been on the tracks instead of you? Hmm. I hadn't thought of it in those terms. And then he said, you need my muscles, but I need your spirit and positive energy. And so we started our journey together. My first role was to make everyone feel good, convince them we'd be OK. My cheery, hi, how are you, rang out every time someone came into the room. Transatlantic phone calls ended with, wow, you sound just like yourself. And my answer was, well, I am the same person, just a lot smaller. <laughs> Every morning, I knew I had a choice to make. I could keep my eyes closed and moan and groan. Or I could sit up, look out the window at the fortress on the hill, have someone open the sliding glass door, and think about what we could do today. Something that would get us one day farther from the accident and one day closer to our new normal. I had no time for why, or what if, or blame. I knew it would take all the energy I had to move on. Dave took charge by setting up a schedule which consisted of breakfast, reading, bathing, visiting family, and lots of daily time outside. <laughs> on our first trip to the garden, we had noticed something highly unusual. They were selling beer in the hospital lobby. All of a sudden, we had a plan. <laughs> when everyone arrived the next afternoon, we loaded up books and blankets, rolled our wheelchairs down to the lobby, bought a few bottles of beer, and paraded out to the garden. Looking at this now, I'm not sure if Dave is making me drink the beer or if he thinks I've already had too much. <laughs> From then on, we held court every afternoon outdoors where we tried to outdo each other with jokes and funny stories. My goal was to make everyone laugh, to see the future as positive, and to avoid tears and negativity. After everyone left at night, though, we forced ourselves to talk until absolutely 9 o'clock every night, by the clock. <laughs> My husband's very black and white. Dave picked things out of our life that we can still do, things like music, work, travel, reading, eating out, we talked about how we could still do those things if I was in a wheelchair. He concentrated on what we could do and what needed to be done. It was not OK to talk about what we couldn't do, things like skiing or hiking, playing the organ, scuba diving, whatever. Dave's always been that black and white sort of person that I've already alluded to. His immediate response is to create a solution. Notice, I didn't say think about or look for a solution. I said create a solution. Thinking and planning were just about the only things we could do for the next few weeks, so we started making lists. I tried to put the components of my life onto paper. Unknowingly, I was already creating the teams that I would need to work with. Our marriage was uppermost in my mind. And having just listened to that last talk, <laughs> I could go into that a little bit, but <laughs> um, we'll let that go. <laughs> Knowing that I'd have to lean on Dave, but wanting to maintain our very different personalities was a really big issue for me. We knew we'd need our friends and didn't want to push them away. In addition, at the top of my rehab list were the basic activities of daily living. I wanted to become independent again and my hope to drive a car and to use my prostheses. While way off in the future, I really wanted to go back to work and be a doctor. Our last night in the Salzburg Hospital came in late September. Five surgeons filed in and they stood at the foot of our beds to bid us an emotional farewell. Three and a half weeks ago, these vastly experienced gray-haired trauma surgeons had saved my life. The one who was fluent in English spoke for them. 
we have something we'd like to say. We've been watching you and your husband for the past three weeks. If you were Austrian, you might not have opened your eyes yet. You have shown us what we believe is the American spirit. Dave and I were silent, not wanting to break the spell. We knew it was time to leave the hospital and our castle on the hill, time to go home and prove these men right. With Dave's love, I knew we could do it. We were medevac back to Balboa Naval Regional Medical Center where Dave returned to his residency as a radiation oncologist in the Navy. There were very few triple amputees in the United States and the doctors who consulted with us told me that I'd probably never walk. Then I met Donna Pavlet. This is not working. Ah. A hard driving 29 year old woman who pushed me, pulled me, cajoled and provoked me. My goal was to get her to laugh every day, but hers was to get me to concentrate. Our enthusiasm was in contagious. If you had looked into the room, you would have seen patients and therapists laughing while sitting or lying on the floor, butt walking, doing one hand pull ups, or lopsided one hand push ups, all of them vying to see who could have the best time. Sweat rolled down my face as I stood in my new legs, <laughs> legs that looked something like they had come from a plumbing store. Up and down the halls we walked, then out onto the hospital grounds, tethered to Donna by a rope and a belt around my waist. People see me. Some of them say hi, but most of them look away. They don't know what to say. In my mind, I say, hey, I'm just like you. In fact, this could be you. Four months later, after I tried on my first set of fake legs, I walked a mile. I was thrilled over the moon with happiness. Four months before, life as I knew it had seemed to be over. But was it? What do you do once you get new legs? Are you the same person? Dave and I worked hard to recreate our lives. <laughs> and then one day we really discovered that we had recreated. We were going to have a baby. And I, pardon me, but I do have to tell you, as my kids grow up, I overheard a lot of funny conversations from little kids like, oh, how did your mom and dad have sex? How did they have babies? <laughs> And I was really tempted to just go out and show them, but I didn't think that was, was a good idea. So totally warped their ideas. So <laughs> stuff that you can find on the TV. Where's that computer at Scripps? So. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we got ready to have the baby. All of a sudden, this wasn't about just me anymore. This was nine months after the accident, and it gave me the impetus to keep learning to get stronger and walking because now I was distracted from being just me, I had to start thinking about somebody else. I'd be changing diapers, cooking, feeding, and playing with just one hand. We were going to be a family, and we're going to do all those things that families do. We had to be as normal as possible. A year after the accident, I returned to Los Angeles to finish my radiology residency. I gave birth to Tiffany in 1981, and three years later, our son Brian was born. Our li lives look pretty much like everyone else now. We'd get up early every morning. Dave would help me get my legs on. I'd get in my car, which was adapted for me to drive. I'd take the kids to school. I'd go to work at UCSD. I'd come home and fix dinner and get everybody ready for bed, pretty much like everybody else. Finally, when I thought that Brian and Tiffany thought everyone's mom had a wheelchair, an elevator, and walked with a cane. Their friends thought I was kind of weird. When told I'd lost my arm, their friends often wanted to help me find it. <laughs> After all, that's what you do when you lose something. <laughs> Having kids forced us to innovate, to get out and go. First, it was the nearby beach in San Diego, at least twice a week, with beach toys and dinner in the sand. And that's the north side of the pier at Scripps. So if you'd been going there 35 or 30 years ago, you would have seen us there many, many times. Having kids made us get out and go. But I'd always loved the outdoors. I'd hiked Mount Whitney and Half Dome, both of them twice. I'd been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But because I thought I'd feel really bad about being out in the wilderness and not doing things, we hadn't been back out there. Brian was five and Tiffany was eight when my college roommate Carla called one day and said, 
Hey, Linda, when are you going to get your butt back outdoors and go camping? You raising city slickers or real kids? So just like that, we had a new team, our camping team, a rambunctious Montana family with two kids. Yellowstone became the first chapter of our travel saga. For five days, we canoed the remote south end of Yellowstone Lake, which was accessible only by non-motorized boats. Boy, did we ever get back into the wilderness. Ten day long trips, canoeing and kayaking, usually over 100 miles of lakes and rivers, places where we rarely saw anyone else. We camped in the dirt where I was queen in my kitchen without walls. I butt walked down to the shore to the lake and pumped water through the filters. It might have looked funny, but it was fun. And I felt like I was contributing. At the end of the first trip, we realized that I needed to be carried, so Dave concocted the first of many pack frames. <laughs> my vanity got in the way, so for the first editions, I sat in it with my legs on, a totally stupid way of doing things. <laughs> it didn't take long to realize that fake legs were useless out in the wilderness, and we could go much farther without them. Uh. <laughs> well, I skipped part of that. I'm having a good time with this little thing here. I don't think I'll go back. Anyway, I have to go back and see. You have to see. There, that one. This, I have to. Okay, another little aside. Treble clefts. You made me cry this afternoon because Climb Every Mountain is our family theme song. And this is, as you can see, I said thank you to Julie Andrews down here. But this picture is the way my husband has carried me on his back now for the last 25 years. And what's more fun is to see people coming down the trail looking at this two-headed, two-legged <laughs> person. And if they, you stop, if we were to turn around and look back up the hill, they have always stopped and they're looking back down the hill to see what in the world they have just passed. But this is when I finally realized that I didn't need my legs. This was the last trip that I took them and from then on we left them in the car. And if I ever get my book written, this will be on the cover of it. So <laughs> this is how you're gonna recognize me by that picture. Over the next 20 years, in addition to wheelchairs, I was pulled on dog sleds, snow sleds, road horses, rafted, and even wheelbarrowed in remote places in South America. Not everything worked. The mermaid swimming plan failed, <laughs> as did the miniaturized skier. <laughs> That's up in Squaw Valley, and it just didn't work. You'd go about three inches, and you just couldn't get anywhere with those little tiny legs. Everyone who knows us would say that our lives were normal. And so after 30 years of interpreting a half a million imaging studies at UCSD, I agreed with Dave that it was time to retire. Time to enjoy our granddaughter, travel, and enjoy life. Time to figure out how to do new things like paddling a kayak. And then it happened. It's Christmas Day, and we're expecting 30 people for dinner. Our grown children are happily cooking, but I'm freaking out. Out of nowhere, I start yelling at them. Hurry up! What's, we aren't going to make it in time. What's wrong with you guys? I'm hyperventilating and shaking. What is wrong? Linda, the cool as a cucumber person, has lost it. Five weeks later, I hear Dr. Hauser say the words, I think you have Parkinson's disease. Our smart medical friends all say, you can't have that. You don't have the typical signs. Wanting more certainty, I seek a second opinion over at UCSD, <laughs> where I used to work. But they can't make the diagnosis either. It's then that the radiologist inside me says, go ahead, get that nuclear medicine scan so you'll know if it's true or not. As I watch the images appear on the monitor, I see the abnormality, an absence of radionuclide uptake. Oh no, it's another amputation. But this time it's part of my brain that's missing. Dave and I start thinking about those little things that have snuck into my life over the past few years. Difficulty writing, occasional slurred speech, restlessness in my leg and arm, and that anxiety. It seems like we're back to square one. We've been hit and knocked down. What are we going to do? Well, 39 years ago, I was working out all day in physical therapy to get strong enough so I could work. Exercise is even more important now. And as you've heard today, it's critical that all of us with Parkinson's exercise vigorously. 
as you can imagine, with only one limb. Oh, that's me. That's my exercise bike at home. <laughs> my, my, two of my best friends came over one day, and my legs were sitting in the corner, and they just put them over on the bike, and we thought, yeah, if you could just do that and make them sweat, I'd have it made. It <laughs> doesn't work that way. Uh, anyway, so as you can imagine, with only one limb, it's hard for me to exercise to get sweaty enough to raise my heart rate. I'd love to have gone up Mount Kilimanjaro like a group here did a few years ago, but I can't. It's a physical impossibility that I have to accept. I would love to go to rock steady boxing three times a week, but I've gone and I could do so few of the exercises that I chose not to slow everybody else down. However, I had to find an alternative solution. I needed a new team to help me find a way to exercise. So over the past year, I've scoured the internet looking for seated cardio exercise videos. Not the old lady, barely moving kind, but the kind that make you sweat and get your heart rate going. You can find a list of these on the resources page of my website, which is here. And you know, I didn't bring it, I have some cards with me that I didn't think about putting in the back. I'll do that after we're done. So what are we going to do now? Along with my Parkinson's patients that are here with me today and our caregivers, we're going to accept the fact that we need to take charge of our lives. We're going to adapt to the changes in our bodies, and we're going to innovate to figure out how to do things in a different way. We're going to work and sweat. We're going to rock steady boxy. We're going to sing. We're going to dance, do yoga and tai chi, and take our medication. We're going to help find a cure by participating in clinical trials and donating to research. Let's all do this together. And let's keep on going. Thank you.